Hello, everybody. And thank you for coming and joining us and spending time on what is probably the first really this beautiful Friday uh, of spring. Those of you who are academics uh, really don't spend very much time in the seminar room, and those of you who are not are probably wondering why I'm still talking. So um, I'm Stefano Girolano, so I'm the director of the Remark Institute, uh, and I uh, will be your host today uh, with me are Amy Nguyen, Sam Paul, and Hayley Ackerman, uh, who um, close off the Remark team. And we're here to celebrate the publication of uh, Quinn Slobodian's new book, Crack Up Capitalism, Market Radicals and the Dream of a World Without Democracy, which is out with Metro which is now out with Metropolitan Books. And literally outside the room, uh, you can get uh, a copy of your own. Quinn teaches at Wellesley and will soon be starting in a new position as professor of international history at the Purdy School of Global Studies at Boston University. He's also an associate fellow at Chatham House, co-director of the History and Political Economy uh, Project, and also co-editor of Contemporary European History, the journal. Uh, I feel like this should always be mentioned for those of us who actually do do the editorial. <laughs> um, now in his last and award-winning book, Globalists, Quinn offered the then counterintuitive and now canonical intellectual history of neoliberalism, as a movement that sought not the liberation of markets, but their protection from politics, particularly from radical politics. That key insight is at the foundation of crack up capitalism as well, which concentrates on the legal and economic perforations, as he calls them, perforations of the state and all the more so of society as these are established in, uh, let's say, late neoliberalism at this point. I quite like the other expression that you brought in, the voided, the voided patterning uh, of society as this emerges. Now, the supposedly free zones, as he shows, cut right through political and especially democratic rule and regulation, and they generate a kind of voluntary succession system, the voluntary secession system, where sovereignty give ups, uh, gives up regulation for uh, the good of a certain uh, small number of people and the money that they make out of it. Crack of capitalism becomes a name for the apocalyptic economics whose pieces we so often glimpse little by little, but which Quinn weaves back together into a single story. And it's a story of secession dreams, of sacrifice zones, of anarcho-capitalism. I could keep uh, replaying and replicating the opposite names that he uses. The story of the way the world is working, as he puts it, and the people who are working to fracture it further. Now to discuss with Quinn, uh, we have with us Rana Furuhar, who is associate, uh, associate editor and columnist in the Financial Times, and CNN's Global Economic Analyst. She's the author of three books, most recently, Homecoming, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World, which was published last year. Um, Rana has been central to the new discussions of what comes after neoliberalism, and she has engaged with Quinn's earlier book um, with globalists, for example, in a foreign affairs article from last October, appropriately titled After Neoliberalism. And with Quinn and Rana will be Clara Matei, uh, who is an assistant professor of economics and the brilliant historian of the origins and coercions of austerity politics. Her book, The Capital Order, How Economists Invented Austerity and Paved the Way to Fascism, was published by Chicago last year. So I'd very much like it if when you walk out of here, you would all get all three books, all three of the recent books. Uh, but for the time being, uh, let's get started. Quinn will uh, speak first. This is a structure we'll take. Uh, Quinn will speak first and then uh, Clara will, will follow and then Rana will engage with Quinn before we open it up for questions. For those of you who are online, please post your questions in the Q&A or chat uh, and the Q&A uh, and I will read them accordingly. So please phrase them in a way that I can actually go ahead and uh, read. So yeah, without further ado, Quinn, the stage is yours. <clears throat> yeah, thanks everybody for coming, um, especially on such a nice day. It wasn't mentioned and maybe most of you know, but I went to NYU. I uh, graduated 15 years ago um, down the street and actually thought that the Remark Institute was still over there. And I was looking forward to yet another beautiful day inside of a windowless <laughs> chamber. So this is actually this amount of sunshine is very welcome. Um, my first class, I think, was with Yanis Katonis and maybe my second was with Jane Burbank and I TA'd for her. So it's, among other things, kind of a homecoming too, to cite the title of uh, Rana's book. Um, so I think that I was I was going to say something first about about the challenges of of writing a trade book, especially because there, I think there are many people who are not they're coming maybe from, more from journalism here, who maybe interface more with those kind of books than academic books. And 
it was a learning experience. <laughs> Let me put it that way. I, I didn't think I was going to be that good at it, but I think I was even less good at it as I hope than I hope that I would be, because it turns out that there's a very specific kind of a skill involved in writing a trade book, which can only be kind of described as surfing the zeitgeist um, in the sense that, and, and this is coming from someone who's never even tried to surf because I know how bad I would be at it, but the coordination involved at sort of figuring out where the wave is coming from, how it's going to look three seconds from now, um, how my body should be positioned to take advantage of that. Very hard and something that academics very rarely, if ever, think about. Right. I mean, if we're not surfers, I don't know what what <laughs> the sedentary version of a surfer is. We're lying on the beach, I guess, reading. Um, you know, when we write a book, we know, we only know that it will come out sometime in the future. Um, we only really need to sufficiently impress a very small group of people, namely the readers, and then maybe the small group of people who might make a decision about your tenure case or your promotion case or whatever. What happened in the course of writing this book was. Um, a deep and not always totally pleasant relationship with my editor, which involved her constantly um, channeling a kind of a collective reader or a collective we. So even though she as a person would know what I was saying and I knew what I was saying, she would say, we don't know what you're saying. And the, the, the discovery was that when one tries to speak to an ever larger set of concentric circles of potential readers, um, the amount of existing knowledge that they would have about the topic you're talking about sort of diminishes, you know, proportionally. So by the time you get to the large enough concentric circle that a self-respecting trade editor would want you to be speaking to, you have to assume that 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 reader at the marginal reader at the edge of that circle knows absolutely nothing. <laughs> so then you have to try to retrain yourself in a voice that speaks to the marginal reader who knows nothing rather than as everything I think I'd written before, which was to the reader who knows exactly as much as I do, <laughs> right? I mean, when I wrote Globalist, I was speaking to myself. I was speaking to myself in the mirror and said, convincing myself of things. And now I had this exercise of, of um, convincing someone I'd probably never met. Um, so that was hard. And how did I end up, what ended up resulting from that? I mean, the the, the it was made doubly hard by the fact that the book was kind of, sold still at the height of Trump in 2019, was largely written in COVID, completed in the sort of springtime of Bidenomics, right? So, so the level of apocalypticism that America, the American mood was inhabiting at any given time was like very much fluctuating across those three years. There was sort of like, things are bad, things are really bad, things are on fire, maybe things are better, maybe the firefighting brigade has arrived to kind of like what, how do we navigate to some kind of nor new normal? The book ends, for example, with the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, which, you know, when I wrote, when I first started writing that in 2019, people were like, well, here comes China. That's the, that's the future. They've replicated the same sort of coaling stations and military ports around the Indian Ocean. And they're, they've become the kind of the new expansive empire taking on the, the um, existing tools of earlier empires. By the time I finished the book, basically all the Belt and Road investments had stopped Many of them were starting to unwind. China's whole economic model was entering into, um, into a question. So in other words, beware historians trying to be journalists without the training of journalists, because we actually don't, we weren't trained for this, for the, flux, the constant fluctuation, the ebb and flow. So the best we can do is what ended up, I think, happening, I brought the British one because I actually kind of like the cover a bit more with this book was a little bit less like surfing, a little bit more like clinging to a piece of timber right in the middle of a storm. So I think I got through. And luckily enough, the subject is lends itself to that kind of um, theme of fragmentation and breakup, obviously. So what did the book end up? Being. I think it was basically two things that sort of sit probably uneasily with each other, but they nonetheless are sitting there next to each other. One is a kind of synthesis of mostly work that other people have done about the way that kind of normative economic models of development have changed from about the 1970s to the present with a big focus on the importance of East Asian developmental models and specifically sort of tiger economy type of models. As someone who spends most of his time writing about histories of neoliberalism, it was kind of surprising how much we had been sort of stuck in this 
Thatcher, Reagan, you know, Pinochet, Thatcher, Reagan. It goes global in the 90s. And then, you know, question mark in, in the more recent past. Somehow, the and the importance of East Asia, the rise of China is difficult to fold into that story. The centrality, I think, of a place like Hong Kong or Singapore as a kind of aspirational model for would-be or putatively neoliberal thinkers um, figured almost nowhere in the kind of literature that that the sort of Mont Pelerin society-centric histories of neoliberalism had been writing. On the other hand, anthropologists and geographers had been all over that story. So Iwa Ong in particular, even Keller Easterling, an architectural theorist, people had been talking about this, this, this space of the zone and looking especially at you know, special economic zones in, the, in, the, in coastal China, looking at the replication or the multiplication of Hong Kongs through the kind of Paul Romer style charter cities, um, thinking very, in very interesting ways often about what Singapore is. Is it a sort of expansionary social democracy or is it an austere sort of neoliberal um, paradigm in action? So looking at the Gulf, you know, what is Dubai as a model for economic development? Why has its, its star shone so brightly, especially in the UK? So the book ended up being a kind of, first of all, a kind of a whistle stop tour of these places that have, for some reason or another, hadn't been on the kind of geography of the mainline histories of neoliberal intellectual history. As it turns out, people like Milton Friedman had been obsessed with places like Hong Kong from the late 1970s onward. And even at the height of the apparent correspondence of capitalism and democracy, when things were going their way in the 1980s, they were still very keen on trying to get closer to the sort of hyper encased non-democratic mini model of a place like Hong Kong. And so the book is in, in a sentence, a kind of a narrative of attempts to replicate the Hong Kong model globally from the 1970s up to the present. Where that runs into another, the second half of the book, I would say, or the other thing the book is doing is this other, what I thought very much underexplored um, set of discussions and conversations within the neoliberal thought world, mm -hmm. which is that of anarcho-capitalism. So I and many others had spent a long time sort of saying neoliberalism is not trying to do away with the state. They're repurposing the state. Neoliberalism is not trying to do with democracy. They're just trying to figure out how to constrain it and tame it in all kinds of ways. All the while knowing somewhere in the back of my head, but there's actually these really radical libertarians who do want to do away with the state altogether, who do want to do away with democracy altogether. And I'll just sort of repress the fact that they exist there because it complicates the narrative too much. At some point that got too much for me. And so I was like, I just need to write about these guys because they're actually fascinating. So the, the story of multiplying Hong Kong also becomes a story, an intellectual history of anarcho-capitalism told less through Milton Friedman, more through David Friedman, his son, who is probably the premier anarcho-capitalist thinker. And also, and here's where it gets interesting, uh, one of the leading uh, creative anachronists in the United States spends a lot of his time um, cosplaying as an 11th century Berber poet, um, launched one of the most popular single sites for medieval reenactments re re in, uh, no in North America, in Northern Pennsylvania, where they stage every summer the Pensick Wars, which is Pennsylvania and Punic Wars put together. Um, mm -hmm. And where he introduced something uh, called the Enchanted Ground, where you put a sort of a golden rope around an area. And if you enter, you are in the Middle Ages. And if you break character, you're immediately ejected. Um, and think the more I thought about this, the more I realized it was actually a really good way to think about the level of almost revolutionary commitment that some of these market radicals or, or radical libertarians had to their kind of ideology. So the other half of the book is attempts to kind of live that enchanted ground of a totally de-democratized, um, contract-based um, radical market enclave vision in small places that they see as laboratories, whether they're gated communities, the charter city in Honduras, and then in sort of the more speculative spaces explored by people like Neil Stevenson and Bruce Sterling, which then become inspiration for sort of online experiments, uh, someone like Balaji Srinivasan, the VC, the tech VC, who is now talking about creating something called the network state his argument being, we LARPed a currency into existence. Why can't we LARP a country into existence? So that is a sort of an attempt to steel man this, this often ridiculous seeming set of conversations, which I think have a lot 
they owe a lot of a, a debt, especially 19th century lineages of liberalism. I've been reading recently Andrew Sartori. I don't know if he's here. Um, Andrew Sartori and Duncan Bell and um, Karuna Mantena. And in the 19th century, it was very common, for example, for liberals to say, let's look back at Roman law. Let's look back at the, the Middle Ages. Let's explore Indian um, forms of living, indigenous forms of living, and see how those could help us think about a normative ideal for the present. That's what a lot of these characters are doing. And there's there's actually sort of more texture and density to that than I think has been um, taken seriously in the past. So as far as where the book ends after that sort of snowball, it's not coincidental. I was just talking to Rana about this a second ago. I think that it sort of landed most in the UK compared to the United States. Why? Because they've had a very recent experience with kind of purist kamikaze libertarianism under Truss and Quartang. Quartang reviewed the book for the prospect or the spectator and basically liked it, said that, you know, at times we sometimes do have to take these revolutionary acts to realize our utopias and it's not going to be easy and we need to figure out roadmaps to utopia. Um, so I think that idea of, you know, the island, the, the British Isles as kind of um, sort of small enough spaces within, within, what, within which one can roll out these radical uh, attempts at breaking through whatever this kind of sclerotic institutions that you think are constraining capitalism are. It feels more natural there. Here you probably have to go to Miami or in some ways Florida or Western United States for it to feel as natural. Here on the Atlantic seaboard, I think we feel a little too comfortable for a lot of this to feel as intimate as it does when you're sitting um, next to Westminster. So I think I'll leave it at that and we'll just see where things go. Thank you. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you, Quinn. It was really lovely. Um, it was, as you see, I, I read the book. <laughs> I also destroyed it. <laughs> and um, it's a, it's been a great read uh, for, and um, yeah, what, what's uh, impressive about it is how it's really like a sharp photo shoot. You really like emerge the reader in these series of disconcerting episodes from the 70s up to the day that take take place globally um, in, in which you really show how there's the one common effort to crap up, crack up capitalism through these zones. And ultimately these zones um, are places where you can really see how economic growth has clear costs, uh, both in terms of less revenue for the state, but more so in terms of wage repression, labor deregulation and fundamental lack of democracy, right? So this is, I think, very interesting as how you show clearly how these zones are actually places of economic success um, that then uh, Im Im implicate that this success is founded mm -hmm. on all of these dark sides that you so well put forward. So one I think of the strength of the book is actually to um, challenge some of the these hard to die tropes uh, of kind of our Western ideology. So maybe I can. I will just go through a couple and show how you kind of um, help. Um, yeah, question them. The first one is, of course, the separation within, with between the market and the state. That is a common theme with the globalist, and of course, how you show how clearly there is this symbiotic relationship between governing authorities and these zone making. So actually, how crack up, cracking up capitalism is a an a, an active political choice. Um, and you show this very well, for example, you say, because the government is caught in a symbiotic relationship with the city billionaires. <laughs> and this, of course, um, an example that I think is, you know, for us, it's very, it's here, uh, the fact that Manhattan's west side uh, has this uh, big uh, headquarter, uh, the Hudson Yards, and it actually received nearly six billion in tax breaks and other government assistance. So clearly this fact about in how the market needs to be encased, as you put it in the previous book, is more than obviously clear in the stories you tell here. Um, and in this, uh, of course, you your focus on um, all the actors that surround Milton Friedman and how they're more radical than Milton Friedman in this anarcho-capitalist vision is really interesting. And this leads me to a second, I think, trope that you challenge, which is the challenge, the trope that 
being an economist, economists buy all the time, which is the separation between economic theory and politics. And it's fascinating here to note how with just some stories about certain actors, you really show how this is impossible. And one example is, for example, Paul Romer, that is a part of your story. Paul Romer, I've studied him in my PhD in economics as, you know, the great um, growth theorist who has um, engaged in endogenous growth models. And if you see, though, how these endogenous growth models cannot really be separated from the political mission of Paul Romer of actually um, then engaging in forms of neocolonialism to try to fundamentally bring about innovation and technological improvement in these areas of the world that supposedly don't have the proper institutions at work and thus cannot grow. So I think it's really interesting how the story of Prospera, the Honduras um, uh, areas of development, um, it, again, I don't think you can understand uh, macroeconomic models uh, of mainstream models if you don't keep in mind what uh, these economists uh, also think about politically. And indeed, their theory helps expand and legitimize their policy proposals. But these policy proposals, I think, are really part and parcel of the theory itself. So I think this is a, a point that you make um, through some uh, stories that are is fascinating uh, to me. Um, then another um, trope that I think you help <laughs> demystify somehow, and it's one that I hadn't thought about uh, critically at all about is how local does not necessarily mean more democratic. And that I found very interesting uh, because uh, actually these plans of secessions are plans of secessions of really tiny areas, uh, cities, even um, just really neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and how this these are there to actually exclude those who aren't um, owners of capital fundamentally and thus capable of participating in these new regulations that the uh, community puts together. And this um, thus ultimately leads to the big theme of the book, of course, which is the relation between um, capitalism and democracy, and which is, has been kind of also the focus of my own work. And it's where maybe I would like to ask you a little bit, just two points uh, that I think we can maybe dig deeper, um, just to get a sense of kind of more of your conceptual foundation here, because the question is, why is capitalism anti-democratic? Is it anti-democratic just in these radical extremes of these actions of these um, anarcho-capitalist or, or liber libertarian ideologues? Or should we think rather that um, this is what they do and think is ultimately the ultimate expression of a much more foundational way in which capitalism is antithetical to democracy and actually requires the suffering and the exclusion of wage labor in favor of the moneyed few, right? The fact that we, the capture of the word freedom and how he, Quinn stresses really well in the book, how the, um, the rankings of economic freedom and how free economically countries are is actually is quite often antithetical to the rankings of countries being politically free. Um, so I wonder, is this just a distortion of, so are we talking here about anti-democratic as being just a distortion from, let's say, bourgeois political representation and so formal democracy? Is this what we mean by anti-democratic? Or do we want to go further and say this is actually the way in which a society that is founded on the exploitation of the many um, then looks like if brought to the extremes, right? So this is where I would like to, to ask you a little bit. And this goes with the other point I had, which is, it seems to me that you oscillate a little bit between your understanding of the role that the state plays in this book, mm -hmm. because uh, on one side, it's very clear that the state and all these political authorities are enabling the zone, um, even, you know, giving up money, giving up, um, yeah, just, well-being of the citizens in favor, of course, of, again, um, increases in economic growth and profit making. But at the other, on the other hand, it seems to me that you're also proposing the state as kind of the alternative way out. You have a sense by which the state can be this the, still the kernel of like a redistribute, redistributive model. Um, and so I wonder how these two roles that the state and the government play are 
work amongst each other and like what is indeed for you the alter the benchmark um mm -hmm. to actually like critique this um tendency that we're seeing in our capitalist economies and it, it, can the state really be let's say the way out given how it's actually completely implicated in in crack up capitalism mm -hmm. so these are just some thoughts and thank you mm -hmm. this was uh fascinating i read it with great joy mm -hmm. joy so thank you great um great so maybe i'll just respond to a couple of the things there one is on paul Rilmer, and i'm glad you mentioned him um so when I started writing the book, one thing I knew that I was doing was sort of writing against what I thought had become a pretty hackneyed idea of the 90s as a as a time, which was uh, supposedly a time of kind of kumbaya style globalization and, and integration, which was then rudely disrupted in 2016 by Brexit and Trump. And that the effort, you know, we had to get back to this liberal international order that had been there and then was gone. And... Uh, there, it was clear that, you know, if you just go back and read the newspaper in the 1990s, you know, most people here were like conscious at that time. The the discussions were anything but that. There was, you know, discussions about secession from sort of Catalonia to Scotland to Quebec. Um, Somalia was a dissolved state. One of the chapters in my book is about a Dutch libertarian in Somalia in the course of the Civil War trying to write a hybrid of Somali customary law with 21st century business Freeport law and create a grafted version of that. He felt like it was possible because there was no formal state at the time in Somalia. Um, Neo-nationalism was a big conversation. One thing I didn't know that I discovered in the course of writing this is that the League of the South in the United States took its name from Lega Nord. It was imitating uh, the efforts of, to secede the, of, from the north of Italy. Um, so I knew that I was already writing against that and trying to reinsert this, this vision of kind of crack up and fragmentation. Even the kind of stuff that Mike Davis writes about in City of Courts is very much in line with this, but Hans uh, Magnus Enzensberger and many other observers at the time. But what I realized when I hit the 2000s, and this is where Romer comes in, is when you watch Romer give his talk about charter cities, first at the Long Now Foundation hosted by Stuart Brand, and then at the you know epoch defining TED talk conference, um, you find that 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 the conversation is entirely couched in terms of something that's not obviously couched in terms of when you first watch it, which is the American invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. That that sort of that sense of of centrifugal breakup that characterized the 90s maybe being carried out by small fugitive actors, a discussion of a kind of a new medievalism through, you know, border crossing mafias and drug dealers and, and things like that and gangs had been replaced by, well, who's really cracking up sovereignty? It's the United States. And they've they've sort of, with the invasion in 2003, declared a kind of open season for sovereignty recreation and scrambling. And so when Romer gives his talk about charter cities, he says, you know, countries should give up parts of their territory to patron countries. He suggests Canada taking over Guantanamo Bay and actually went to Canada to try to argue that they should do it. They turn them down. Um, he says, what, what? why should we do this? Does this look like Iraq? No, because that's by that's through conquest and military violence. And this is through consent. So in other words, the American uh, presence occupation of Iraq acted as kind of the Belgian colonialism to the British yeah. colonialism of the late 19th century. And you could make a case for neocolonialism, a la the charter city model, because there was this worst form of sort of sovereignty creation happening at the time. Um, and he was, of course, rewarded richly for his efforts. And I have some of, he got a very nice place right on Washington Square Park uh, a year after he gave that talk. Um, so, so that's just to say that part of it, that the, the, the 20 years that I kind of cover in the book, the 90s and early 2000s, is also trying to historicize the experience that I had while I was a student here at, at NYU of the kind of disorientation produced, I think, by the American decision to invade Iraq. But it was, it was a break of sorts for a lot of people, and it opened up spaces of possibility for some of the people that I write about. So to your second question, though, of, of how this, um, what this, what this means about um, the state and the role of this was the second one was the state or democracy? Oh, the second one was state, but they're yeah. they're related. So. Capitalism in general. Capitalism in general. So, <clears throat> I mean, one of the things that I find helpful about studying these people is is even if in some cases they didn't have the the most direct effect on creation of policy, 
I think I was I was thinking about the the analog mm -hmm. to like Marinetti, right? Marinetti also did not invent the automobile, and yet he can tell us more about the automobile in his poetry or in the Futurist Manifesto than many of the engineers who created automobiles. And so the anarcho capitalists, although in many cases they were not, not even neoclassicals and were way out of step with mainstream economics, I think they were able to kind of capture a bit of the spirit of the direction of a world and 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 to fully in, in imagine and envision for themselves a world in which the democratic processes that continue to constrain and redirect to some extent the cap capitalism as such are are eliminated so i was someone asked me a couple of or i've been asked a couple of times whether or not i couldn't have also written about people who were envisioning kind of decommodified or kind of non-capitalist forms of secession at the same time and of course I could have, and that would make for an interesting book too. But my response is that it's much easier to imagine the kind of world that they're imagining because we already do, as they often point out, live everyday lives governed by commodified exchange, contract, arbitration, the threat of lawsuits. And what they're arguing for is let's just take that one step farther. Let's just say every two years you don't go and vote. And instead we just have these collectively agreed um, set codes about about um, the organization of possibility and everyday life and so on. So in that sense, I think they're sort of telling a truth about right. the world that we exist in yeah. regardless. Yeah. And so in 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 that sense, the, the attempt to kind of unwind that or undo that is an entirely different project than anything I talk about in the mm -hmm. book, right? I think the, the effort to create a decommodified form of everyday life is something that will have a lot further to move than than it would be to get to their utopias because we're sort of seven eighths of the way there already. Um, the thing that I find interesting though is that as kind of imminent critics or observers of capitalism, often they can produce these kind of um, accidental insights or critiques. So this is very much true for a lot of these people who are in many cases gold bugs right they don't they don't believe in fiat currency they believe in 100 percent gold backed currencies and so then they become critics of not just the federal reserve and fiat money since since the 70s but concentrations of power they become art they they become people who argue for small holding and the possibility of kind of more competition so i think it's worthwhile too and it's something i've been you know, trying to do in some of my work is to sort of look at the ways that these putative or so-called neoliberals are also sometimes good critics of actual existing capitalism, maybe not in a direction that we would necessarily agree with, but they do have a way of identifying or sort of highlighting things going on. Yeah. And, the, and then just to say what you mentioned about the economic freedom of the world index, absolutely. So this is the, this is at the end of the Hong Kong chapter that starts the book, but quite literally, um, the Milton Friedman and co, including many sort of current Hoover senior fellows, all got together in wine country in the mid 1980s and said, this Freedom House Index, this Freedom in the World Index is so popular. How can we do something that doesn't make democracy so important? Because freedom is more than just political freedom. It's also economic freedom. And, and for them, it's actually more economic freedom than political freedom. So they had the, the person, um, Raymond uh, Gastel, his name is, who creates the Freedom in the World Index at the conference. And they asked him, you know, so we were trying to run some regressions on this, but some of the numbers look kind of strange. And there was an asterisk next to Hong Kong at some point. What was that about? And he said, oh, yeah, well, if there's a, if there's an asterisk, it's because uh, my opinion changed about it during the course of the year. And they were like, well, what do you mean your opinion? He's like, oh, I don't know. I just I felt it was less free than it had been at the beginning of the year. And they were kind of like, wait, are you serious? This is how you're making this, you know, internationally renowned, frequently cited, used as an indicator and plugged into formal models. That's all it is. And turns out, yes. So they created their own and they went through like five iterations and changed the weights until they got Hong Kong number one and Singapore number two. <laughs> and it's published in about four thick volumes of the accounts and the minutes of these gatherings. So that's what the, you know, the book is about, too, is the attempt to create these sort of devices or gadgets or optics, ways of sort of reframing what it means to be an exemplary, um, an exemplary economic uh, model in the present day. And the thing I find interesting about the special economic zone or the zone is that 
regardless of how many times it doesn't succeed or it fails to bring in new investment or increase growth or or succeed in any sort of economically measurable way, it continues to be reproduced. I mean, I have, a, as you can imagine, a Google alert for special economic zone. And every day it's like, especially sub-Saharan Africa, mm. you know, more and more and more of these things are being rolled out. And they, um, the question for me is less, you know, why do they work or not work? And more like, how is it that our imagination has been so impoverished that this is the only idea that we have is to sort of ring fence part of national territory, free it from the usual laws and regulations, and make it a kind of non-democratic Hong Kong in miniature. Why has that been such a durable idea against all kind of evidence, you know, to the point that, you know, Truss and Kuarteng tried to do it to a whole country, and in many ways Sunak is in a slightly more moderate way trying to do that still. Yeah. So that that's also the kind of the kind of question that I think I was pursuing was the the um the narrowing of of political economic imagination in a way that isn't captured in the usual narrative which is like either globalization or nationalism right i mean that doesn't explain well how capitalism works as any self-respecting geographer will tell you and it also doesn't even capture well how political ideology works yeah, yeah and just uh, one last comment is interesting because as 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 you show like these economists and not just economists of course of the all these different actors capture the word freedom to mean economic freedom of the saver investor. But they ultimately, as you were pointing out, they were, they're exposing the reality that this economic freedom is based on what you call Milton Friedman's dream world. Labor is obliged to go wherever capital directs it for whatever it chooses to pay. Mm -hmm. So I think this is interesting is that in the background you are saying I mean, they're aware that all of this is possible because mm -hmm. of this constant wage repression and this this economic freedom is based mm -hmm. on this unfreedom of everyone else. So it's interesting to show how indeed they are critiques in the sense that they expose it in their very yeah. uh, doings and ideas in a very clear way. Yeah. And it's not just wage repression. I mean, it's two tier models of citizenship. Absolutely. Right. I mean, Singapore and Dubai, number of non-citizens vastly outnumber the number of citizens. And the model would simply not work without that model of sort of hire and fire and deport. And yet sort of self-respecting people on the right and sometimes the left will talk about the model as if it can somehow have that removed. So I, one response to this was someone said, well, Dubai actually is a, a pretty good place. It is a success in spite of some of its economic policies. And it's like, no, it's <laughs> it's a success because of its economic policies. Yeah, exactly. And the idea exactly. that you could... Um, try to reformat a large industrialized or formerly industrialized economy on a model like that, which would require sort of the disenfranchisement um, of three quarters of the population or the somehow the movement in and out of, 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 of bodies to produce that kind of a ratio is only shows just how few actual ideas are still circulating. I mean, I love Branko Milanovic, but you know his conclusion in capitalism alone is like we basically need a golf style guest worker program in the United States, and this is sort of, you know, not where one would hope the most kind of adventurous theorist of uh, rebooted social democracy might end up. Yeah. Thank you. Um, wow, awesome. You know, I have so many thoughts. Um, First of all, I want to thank uh, Quinn for inviting me to do this in the Institute as well. Um, Quinn's book, The Globalist, was really one of my sort of baseline readings um, for my own book, Homecoming, which tackles a lot of these topics in sort of in a very different starting place. But but we get to some commonality, which I want to I want to draw out. I am a surfer. I am a, a journalist. Steve. I am not an academic <laughs> You and you are boat builders, um, okay. and we need these boats. I mean, and I kept coming back to your sort of intellectual boat as I was surfing <laughs> the political waves. And both things, I think, are really important right now for, for moving the dial in a positive way. Um, I just want to share, actually, because I was... I, I, I just love how you're ripping apart economic models and the sort of... Um, I think one of the fundamental problems with... with um, the economics profession, which is the failure to acknowledge what cannot be modeled and or what is not at least what is not being modeled well. Um, and one of the starting actually the starting point for my book was a conversation that I had, um, and I'll bring this up because it ties to your work, 
with um, the former labor leader, Richard Trumpka, who passed away, used to be head of the AFL-CIO. And I, I went down to ask him, you know, what were the conversations that the American labor movement was having in the 1990s and in the run-up to China and the WTO? What were you being told? Like, how, basically, how did this go so badly? Um, and he said that a policymaker who will remain nameless um, from the Clinton administration had come to him and said, look, we know that um, some of these deals are going to be tough for U.S. labor and indeed for labor in a lot of OECD countries. And um, but don't worry, eventually there's going to be a leveling up and wages are going to equalize globally. And in the meantime, you're going to get a lot of cheap stuff. And Trump has said, well, how long is that leveling up going to take? And the policymaker said with a straight face, three to five generations. <laughs> so like that's what we're dealing with here. Um, and also these are the same guys that are saying that Dubai is sustainable. It has an indoor ski <laughs> slope. I yeah. mean, in a country that is 110 degrees. Yeah. Okay, we'll put that aside for a different different conference. Mm -hmm. But um, so one of the things I'm wondering um, is the balance between global and local. I mean, you know, you so well make the case and I'm very proud. I have, you know, a galley, which these are, you know, tough to come by. Um, uh, you make this case of how well capital has been able to fly at 35,000 feet above the concerns of the nation state or indeed the concerns of democracy in general. I'm going to, um, as a surfer, I'm going to bring you into the present moment. One of the things that I find maddening right now is the way in which even as we have this opportunity in a potentially, de we could call it deglobalizing, but let's call it de-risking world in which we've kind of had a scrim pulled up in the last 15 years between the financial crisis, COVID, war in Ukraine, we're like, oh, okay, you know, maybe super globalized capital is fragile. Maybe you shouldn't get your energy from an autocrat. You know, there's this moment and yet you've got, as policies are being developed with, for example, the Inflation Reduction Act, you've got European companies coming in and arguing, we don't want to say uh, union labor is going to be preferent, uh, you know, treated preferentially. We want to say domestic labor so we can take all the jobs from Denmark and put them in, you know, Georgia or wherever. What, what is, <laughs> why is labor not grabbing this debate and and how can how can labor take this narrative and really um i guess i guess what i'm asking is how can we see the positive side of this instead of you know as you so well do just really really focusing on how the capitalists have kind of devoured the world and elon musk is gonna i don't know fly into space and um i know that's a hard question but it is a hard question <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, I think one thing, one of the ways that I've thought about how this, this worldview and the kind of machinery and the kind of engineering that I describe in the book relates to what might be a more post-neoliberal moment that we're moving in now is to indeed continue to pay attention to the subnational. So um, Clara mentioned this example of the Hudson Yards, right, getting enormous tax breaks because and how many people know this, how well known is in this part of Manhattan, but like they gerrymandered this thing so that it was supposedly part of a distressed economic zone in East Harlem. So therefore it was considered, you know, to be worthy of all kinds of special um, treatments. And the, you know, the Amazon headquarters too is the same thing. Lots of people write well about this. Samuel Stein has a great book about this. And Timothy Weaver has a book which he talks about a lot of the things I do in the book, which is, you know, Canary Wharf as the first example, quite explicitly, as I described in the book, of an attempt to do Hong Kong in the middle of um, a country very much unlike Hong Kong. So that model of what they call incentivized urbanization is easy to make seem grotesque, I think, but is also so far just the way that policy works, right? So I think that the IRA and the mm -hmm. way that it doles out its subsidies is not going to be sort of substantively different, right? I mean, it will still give large tax breaks mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. private actors to build their battery plant or their, you know, lithium mine here mm -hmm. and there. And, um, and it will still be intermediated by the same people who got very, very wealthy in the last iteration of supposedly during neoliberalism. So I think that, you know, it can be helpful to, 
reduce the sense of novelty at some level, I think, to say, you know, the zones may have done this then, not now that we're post zone, what's life going to look like, but more like, oh, what are the new zones going to look mm -hmm. like? Because there will be new ones. And, um, and the, the sort of the, the tax competition between states and between municipalities is not vanishing, mm -hmm. right? And that's still following this kind of the same logic of, of competing in a zero sum way for investor dollars. So that will all continue to happen, even as, you know, at the top level, this will all be in service of supposedly more praiseworthy goals than simply maximizing the bottom line and producing a lot of cheap stuff. Um, so that's more pessimism and rather than optimism in that in that case. I think that to put it more positively, zones are not necessarily bad things. I mean, this was Clara's point too, like this the realization that you had that or the, one of the things that I really drove home is that like the local isn't necessarily more democratic, right? right. Case in point being the 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 burst of gated communities and you know homeowner associations in the 1990s in, in this country that was sort of editorialized by the mainstream press as like another sign of the growing social ennui and the distance and the way that people aren't around each other anymore. And yet to the libertarians of the Cato Institute, or whatever this, they were like, these are amazing. Like we've completely done away with the usual ideas of one person, one vote. Um, we have you know, your control is based on the size of your unit, the number of your units, and we're redoing kind of like an estate system, like in miniature. Um, so that's the bad version of kind of doing zones. But, you know, if you think about zones as just as sites of, of greater intensity of economic activity enabled by sort of state incentives and inducements, then what happens inside that I think is still open to contestation and and right so if you make that then a, a zone where one has better access to daycare one has better paying jobs one has the right to unionize then right. then it's a good zone right and i guess that's what so in your sort of crit overall critique of capitalism i'm i'm thinking a lot about this right now in terms of how we take this moment and and take whatever opportunity to structure things in a better way can mm -hmm. be taken. Mm -hmm. Let's put aside, you know, the, the particulars of a policy like the IRA or what Europe is doing with chips or, mm -hmm. and let's just say, do you think that there is an opportunity if we are moving into a place where I think, you know, even neoliberal, many neoliberal, although not all uh, economists would agree that growth for its own sake mm -hmm. is, is not sustainable. And, mm -hmm. you know, in really in any fashion. And to that point, I actually agree with um you know, you mentioned the gold bugs. Mm -hmm. um, it's fascinating to me that I get more smart critique of of uh, late stage capitalism from hedge fund newsletters than mm -hmm. in than in many other places. It's mm -hmm. it's really quite striking. And I got the most feedback on my first book about financialization mm -hmm. from like you know the George Soroses of the world, not mm -hmm. because of open society, but because they're thinking about how is this going to affect their portfolios. Mm -hmm. um, so could you imagine? different incentives if we if we assume that growth needs to be inclusive and sustainable is there actually a better way forward um you know in some uh more localized way uh, you know mm -hmm. help me to understand that mm -hmm. dot connection yeah i mean this is partially why i think this was a change of of subject from the globalist book in and it relates to what you're saying because the idea of, the glo of globalists and the idea of like this Geneva school of neoliberalism that I introduced there is that the sort of prime directive is like protect the whole, mm -hmm. like the totality of the world economy is the thing that needs to be preserved. And capitalism, you know, requires different solutions and different fixes at different times. And often nations sort of play spoiler and de democratic nations even more often play spoiler to like the smooth functioning of the whole. So there is a kind of like long termism built into that and a kind of like a utilitarian attitude towards the kind of policies you choose. Yes, you have your first principles, but occasionally you can stretch them and bend them if you need to do certain things to make sure that, you know, competition, you know, can, continues to produce growth or whatever. The interesting thing about these people and the crack up capitalists, and I think it is a bit of a difference of a generation from the sort of Hayek Friedman era of high growth, sort of golden age, 50s, 60s, 70s, to a kind of post-70s, more declensionist kind of um, 
fear that the good times are not going to return is that the idea of the totality kind of goes away. And the crack up part is the, is, is a lifeboat attitude rather than a globalist attitude, mm -hmm. which is like, let's build a lifeboat and make sure that it's well fortified and make sure we have enough of our supplies on board and let's get out of here. And so the timeline of modernization, you know, which, which, you know, was so familiar from the forties to the seventies that all countries and regions were sort of marching along at different rates, but somehow still coevally um, is gone. Mm. There's no expectation that most of the world population will make it, that will be part of anything productive here. If you're a gold bug, you know, you're taking for granted that the world economy as it exists now cannot continue to exist because right, if you right, go right. to 100% gold back yeah. money, everything stops. Yeah. And to some people, some people think that's just like a KO punch against the gold bugs way of thinking, but to them, it's not, it's just like, yeah, that's right. And we will all withdraw to the free state of Texas and the rest of it will burn. <laughs> right. And you're like, well, I guess that is, I suppose that is sort of like a reasonable conclusion from your own premises. Um, so in that sense, I think if that's not the world you want, which is obviously not one that any of us do, then the question is, you know, at what scale do you begin to kind of expand the space of provisioning, the space of um, adequate attention, adequate care. And that, I think, is the question, right? I mean, the way that globalists was sort of misread by some left populists, left nationalists, uh, Wolfgang Streich in particular, and, and some um, even right-wing nationalists, was that it was a defense of nationalism, mm -hmm. that the, the, the community of fate is the nation, so the globalists need to go so that we can get back to the proper unit of governance, which is the nation. Uh, I don't agree with that, in fact. I think that was a misreading of what I wrote in that book. And part of this is a kind of, as a trying to open up, I think the question of like, well, where's the scale? Mm -hmm. I mean, the United States is a, is a very decentralized place. And so you have a lot of options, right? You yeah. have state level, you have the city level, you have municipalities, you have counties. Um, so I'm not equipped to answer that one very well because I think it's very it very much depends on circumstances and the kind of economic activity you 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 know you want to be up to. But I do think that that one can rebuild spaces of like dense and 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 um, and vital democratic decision making at very small scales and then and then move them upward. So I'm not I'm not a pessimist that that's possible. I just think that that's not the direction of travel. Um, let me ask you just a couple more quick questions, and then I guess we'll open it up. Um, first of all, I, 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 the gold bug scenario that you sketch, which it always, it, I, I always think about this with these sort of hyper libertarian techno, whatever you want to, you know, however you want to frame them, is like who's going to smelt the steel? Like who's going to, you know? I never quite understand the mm -hmm. fantasy. But the fantasy is actually changing in some ways. It's becoming not about owning gold, but about owning um, commodities, which mm -hmm. is sort of interesting. It's a little mm -hmm. bit more of a Mad Maxy, you know, mm -hmm. sort of future. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, two final questions. Uh, I I find, as I think you have in the UK, my book was a little more US centric, and mm -hmm. there's a big appetite for what is the post-neoliberal narrative? How do we make this simple? How do we take this? I mean, not that it can be sim made too simple, but how do you really communicate it to the public? Like what would be your advice to all of us who are in different forms are trying to do that mm -hmm. and also connect the dots, you know, across different countries? Um, and then I'm curious what the most interesting response is that you've had, you know, either pro or con to your book and what, you know, what it tells you. Sure. Um... One of the things I really struggled with, especially at the level of kind of writing and metaphor, was to try to figure out how to describe the desires of people like, so Hans Hermann Hoppe is one of these very radical anarcho-capitalists, and he wants to turn Europe back into a, a, a continent of 1,000 polities. So right? like we're going to go back to the year 1,000, minimum 1,000 different small polities, you know, a lot of duchies and so on. Um, but he wants to remain completely globally interconnected. So he wants to have access to all of the world's um, goods, you know, potential movement of migrants, the ones that you want, um, you know, an, an interconnected global economy for, for monetary purposes and trade purposes, if not for immigration purposes. And I didn't know how to describe that vision because we have a whole set of metaphors from the 90s, sort of Apadurai type stuff, right? Like scapes and flows. And, mm -hmm. and we have an idea of, 
of of everything being constantly moving nodes uh, in networks mm. but the idea of being sort of simultaneously cloistered while hyperconnected was something that kind of eluded me and still does in some ways because they're secessionists and people hear that and they're like ah so they want to go and like sort of live off the land or something well no they want to secede and yet remain hyperconnected um so i think that you know as as far as a narrative that we should move towards i think it's not necessarily i think there's something to be learned in inverse there which is which is we don't just want to inverse the scale and say we just want to go local and we need to just think about our own people in our own backyard because then you do i mean i live in new england there's this great snl skit i don't know if people saw it with adam driver where that's a league of the south meeting and they're like i just want to go somewhere where i can you know be around white people and grow vegetables with my own hands and trade them with other white people. And someone's like, I think you're talking about Vermont. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a there is a way that that direction of that, just thinking about ever smaller scales can be pretty pernicious. Yeah. And also, you know, I, we were talking about this momentarily before, but the biggest thing that's plaguing, obviously, this shift to post neoliberal paradigm is the danger of um, growing hostility with China. And that is made possible by this idea of kind of global versus national, you know, in which you produce senses of block rivalries and you dissolve those connections that actually do exist. And I think in a in a properly leftist progressive internationalism should be emphasized that exists between like the class position of a Chinese worker and the class position of an American worker. And where is that conversation in the post neoliberal uh, policy discussion? I mean, it's, if, if it's happening, I haven't noticed it because so far I feel like even people who are sympathetic to the post neoliberal move who have been criticizing neoliberalism for years who know something about China or who are worried about um, great power conflict and um, and foreign policy in that sense have almost been willing to give up on post neoliberalism if it's going to only be purchased at the cost of um, you know driving up the desire for war with China. So if anything, I think that that sense of how to be both you know caring for one's own, so to speak, while also being attentive to all the ways you still remain um, connected with and should remain identifying with and in solidarity with people in similar relationships in the world economic order is something that uh, I think is a work in progress for sure. Well, I love the book and I love globalists and thanks for talking Thank about you. Appreciate thing. it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to take chairs prerogative. We'll get too far away from, from the way in which you answer the question, Clara's question around capitalism, and the way in which you evaded the uh, this point on labor, mm -hmm. and I'm very curious with what with about what's there. Is there something? Is it more that okay? I guess I can't make a binary, but I'll make a binary. Is it more that you're trying to avoid discussing labor because it is necessarily a sort of very sort of clouded or know, unclear, relatively obscure figure in the way that people think? Mm -hmm. Or is it more that this is an effort, rather than appeal to labor as a sort of counter, to present it as a counter, to think of this as a sort of, or maybe to think of both books as a sort of discourse on voluntary servitude, in which people sort of end up accepting a certain kind of scenario and mm -hmm. then submitting to it, and there's a kind of revelatory function that you're playing. Bringing this in, whereupon the revelatory of the imminent critique function that you play mm -hmm. is one that sort of de facto cannot uh, appeal to labor as a way out. Um, I guess I could answer with a, an anecdote from the from the conclusion, which is from the Parable of the Sower um, by Octavia Butler, a wonderful book. And at one point in the in the novel, her family has been living in this sort of self-fortified community and the, the, the perimeter has been breached and so on, places have been burned, everyone's been um, attacked. And so they need to find a new place to go. And the place that they have in mind is uh, a desalination plant on the coast that is owned by a multinational conglomerate. And if you enter it, you lose your status as an American. It's sort of a deterritorialized space, uh, but you get shelter and sort of protection from the world beyond and some kind of work. Um, she's reflecting on the main character and she says you know i know this situation because i've got a bookshelf full of science fiction novels 
at home that my mother and my grandmother used to read. And this is a common scenario, which is like the person, the, the antagonist, protagonist is in a company town and they figure out a way to kind of overthrow the company town and escape. He's like, but in real life, we try to get into the company town. And that's always how the world has actually, never actually been able to overthrow the company town. So I think there's, a, there's an insight there, which is probably, you know, something that I'm implicitly getting to in the book, which is there is this kind of like a lovely phrase in the title of that recently published book, a mute compulsion in, in, in the way that one's labor ends up being kind of inscripted into these forms of governance, even against your better judgment. But I think it's also, you know, the 90s, early 2000s sort of pivot or crux of the book is also relevant here. So I was also just rereading um, a book which I hadn't read since it was published, which is The New Imperialism by David Harvey, which I'm sort of starting to see as like a very epoch-defining book, partially because of his introduction of this idea of accumulation by dispossession, which is now, I think, the, the subject of just almost like the default subject of a dissertation now, if you want to start in the social <laughs> sciences or in history, and that, that focus on land, focus on the tangible. Um, and one of the points he makes in that book, which I think is good, is that, you know, the nature of that, that 90s, 2000s moment was such that the old fronts defined by trade unions and defined by the old fashioned class politics had really had a bunch of holes punched in them by indigenous politics, by fights over land, by dispossession in new ways like intellectual property. Um, and that those coalitions were often lined up against old fashioned kind of nationalist trade union politics, especially in places like Latin America. So I think that it's not clear to me in the way that, for example, it probably is, um, would be for Clara, like in your book, that like the, the counterweight to this politics is like an organized working class within trade unions with, with you know, perhaps the goal of class struggle leading to revolution. It doesn't seem apt to the period that I'm writing about. So it's, a, it's much more this kind of this assumption that a kind of molecular novel form of politics would have to arise to stand up against this novel and molecular form of class role. Um, so in that sense, I find I, I try to avoid the, the morally satisfying and tidy thing, which is just like, well, everyone just needs to join a union and we can get this thing, get this thing back in order because I feel like it doesn't get to the particularity of that. 